Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sounds and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thank you so much for checking out the series. As always, uh, you know how this works. If you like what you see here and all that, hit that subscribe button. I do three new interviews every single week, a brand new one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. And I got to tell you, one of my all-time favorite artists I get to talk to today, Mr. Rick Miller from Southern Culture on the Skids. Hey, sir. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. It's so good to talk to you. I've been a fan for so long, and I am so excited to be talking about a brand new record right here. Oh, yeah. yeah. Called At Home, Home Southern Culture. It's my dog on the cover. That's a, oh, that's right. <laughs> His name is Buck. We named him after Buck Owens. We're fans. <laughs> the dog does not sing. I, I think I remember you saying online, but... Uh, no, he doesn't sing. Does take a nice picture there. Yeah. He's my biggest critic, though. He says a lot of my work's just playing rough. <laughs> Uh, ah, it's a good bad. way to start. Know, yeah. It's a good way to start. I like that. He <laughs> was here for most of the recording, though. You know. So, well, okay. So he gets to. He gets to have the opinion on it. It's totally fine. He does. He does. Yeah. I, I know cool. it's the obvious, the obvious title here, but is there a little callback to a uh, Screaming Jay Hawkins with that at home with by any chance? Well, no. I'm a fan of Screaming Jay, but no, 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 no. It was just kind of how where we ended up with the record. We made it mostly here in my living room. So we just thought, well, it's at home with Southern culture on the skids, you know? Yeah. So recording it this way, uh, writing it, I don't know if the songs were written during all of this, but uh, knowing that, you know, it's at least a portion of this all happened within the pandemic. Does that change the way you would actually typically even write the song? Is there differences in the record with that? I think there is because most of the songs I had to write myself with the guitar without the band. And we brought them in as I got it down. So it's almost a little more, I would, I would not use this term with us, but a little more singer songwriter in, in a way, right? Mm -hmm. oh, as we could only be. But, and again, recording most of it here in my living room, basically where I'm standing, is uh, we had to use, you know, we just couldn't be as loud. So we used a very small drum kit. We used uh, very small amplifiers, much more acoustic guitar on this. I think the one thing that was really interesting was how much more we got. We we worked on vocals on this one because I, I don't, maybe it's just the comfort of being in your own living room. Um, but uh, Mary and I had a great time singing and working on the melodies on these songs. It was really fun. Yeah. You mentioned that singer songwriter thing. You really get that at the very end of the record with everything grows in her garden. I mean, that's, that's the most non-traditional Scott song, I think on the record. Uh, maybe that's why it's at the end. Yeah. And I thought it was a good, it was a good finishing song, you know, cause it's, it's optimistic. It ends on an upbeat uh, note. I think, you know, it's time to get to work. Mm -hmm. Getting work in her garden, you know, where all yeah. things grow. <laughs> Does, um, I guess, you know, you, you write, you know, when you look at songs like Java or whatever, you know, there, there's a traditional way that you write, but, but is it, is, is what's happening out there represented in some way on this record? Did you find that you were reflecting or wanted to reflect what was happening in the world within the songs? Well, I think uh, that obviously uh, Call Me, was literally about the first few weeks of the pandemic. I mean, literally, I was sitting on my front porch trying to get online to get some unemployment, you know, and figure out what to do next. And oh, the sites just kept crashing and then the bad news just kept flashing, you know, and I mean, I and I just wanted to talk to somebody, you know, and everything that was cut off. So that song obviously you know and, and the one line in there is true man i mean it took me a i had to, i had a connection at the local supermarket that's the only way i could get bananas and garlic right and toilet paper he would call me and let me know when the trucks were coming oh wow <laughs> so those lines they Not may sound silly but they are all true they yeah. are all true <laughs> it is really interesting and you know just hearing that like I talked to, it's it's funny hearing what musicians have been able to find inspiration within this, because I was talking to some who were like, I didn't really write anything this year, because what am I going to write about? I couldn't, but, but you found a way, I guess, to figure that out. Well, I mean, it, I think all, I think little things make great songs. And if you can just find something that you do during the day that you can reflect on a bit, you know, and write a song about it. And when you're writing the lyrics, you never really know where it's going sometimes. And then once you 
hear it with the music, it defines it more. But then it kind of has to age a while. And then you go, oh my gosh, I see kind of what I was thinking about that. Or I, I see where that was going, right? And uh, so, no, I actually really enjoyed writing during the pandemic uh, <laughs> because I, well, one thing, we weren't on the road and mm -hmm. I could take much more time in thinking about the songs and the lyrics and the melodies and things like that. So that was nice, actually, to have that time to sit and just think about nothing but music. And we never really, I, I just figured if we had the time off, the best thing we could do was just work and write and play. And uh, obviously we couldn't do it all together a lot of times, but, you know, we did, you know. Mm -hmm. And we got the records. We have actually, and we had another record out. I got it right here. That this one mm -hmm. is. There was six newer songs on this one. This was re actually the first six songs were a reissue of a old analog box set that we did. But we did more covers and put them on that, and and then we did all these originals. But no, I I enjoyed my. I made a good use of my time. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. You brought up the uh, the Kudzu Records presents the record there. I, I, I get that the the four six new songs, four of them were covers. I got to tell you, Jesus took my burden. Sounds so good. Like I love oh. the sound of that song. <laughs> that's Slim Whitman. That's oh like, yeah, I, that's like one of my uh, guilty pleasures. I do <laughs> like me some Slim Whitman. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean he can yodel. You know, I I don't know. I, the Wayward Wind is a great song too, and some of the songs are almost surreal. The way he talks about the I can I can only give you the Milky Way and things like that, and that Western kind of thing with the yodel and the the reverb. I don't know. It's kind of surreal. There's a surreal edge to all that stuff too. You just got to look for it. You know, you got to dig a little deeper. Yeah, you know, that psychedelic cowboy style. I think I, I think, right. tend to think of that, which which really isn't <laughs> far off from the surf rock thing. You know, I, I've talked to Marty Stewart. He he dabbles a lot in that kind of thing, taking the uh, the old rockabilly surf rock, but putting that psychedelic desert thing on there. I mean, what a great genre, niche genre. Oh yeah, well I think it it's very it relates because surf music kind of bled into to the psychedelic movement, right? Back in the '60s, so you know it's a kind of logical progression in a you know sort of a historical way. And I know that Marty Stewart is a is a music historian, you mm -hmm. know, and that's the cool thing about playing rock music nowadays is that you can draw on all these genres, you can pull it together, and if you're a music fan like I am. It's it's so much fun, right? Yeah, Especially yeah. on covers records, yeah. where you can take and twist it around a little bit. We started doing that on country politan favorites, and we kind of did it a bit on this one, not quite as much, but it's you know, if you're a fan of music, it comes out, right? And a lot of it comes out just like that, where you're twisting genres, blending genres, you know. It's like I say, it's like a plate lunch, you know. It's like you got your meat, you got your potatoes, you got your peas, right? but they all blend together in the middle and that's the best bite, right? <laughs> it, it's, and you've made a great career out of that. I mean, some of the greatest songs, you know, especially in these sounds that we're talking about here, I, I want to tread some old ground, um, but, but specifically even, like I even hear it on the first single in this Run Baby Run, what, your music works so well with uh, the horror genre, the thriller genre, that type of like, you know, I, what I write down here, you know, when I when I look back and I think of those old cartoon skeletons dancing, you know, from oh, the yeah. 30s and 40s, like, <laughs> where did that sound come from for you? When did you start to figure out that you all were good at that? Well, we I, I love horror movies ever since. I mean, Growing up, I remember like B movies, grade Z movies, right? At the we at the drive-ins and and at the local theaters, matinees and stuff. As a kid, we've just always loved horror movies, and Mary loves horror movies too, right? So that whole and and just the idea of B movies. I love B movies because kind of like the auteur, the directors, you know, no budgets. They do it. It's a lot of it's DIY. They get to you know, it's like it's their vision, right? They don't have to answer to a lot of commercial. You know, they do have to answer to some commercial, but not as much as like major studio stuff. So I love watching and film noir. We've got that one song on there called Night Driver. That's a great like film noir mm -hmm. kind of theme song. And Run Baby Run would be great. Like Mary, I was always thinking it would be great to get a green screen with Mary on a motorcycle, right? With like all and find out all these cheesy monsters that you could throw behind her, like chasing her, you know, and I, <laughs> you know, she'll outrun them all. You know? <laughs> 
it just works perfect for that stuff. And, and like I said, like, like, like most people, like a lot of people, I should say, you know, I, I first heard you guys with Camel way back in the day, but <laughs> yeah. it was, um, it was, um, it was Strangest Ways that really brought me in. And it was because, what was that on the soundtrack? I, I, it was that I Know What You Did? I Know What You Did Last Summer. That's right. Right. Which the song <laughs> is much better than the movie. I'll point that out. To... <laughs> well, you know, we, when we made that movie, the wildest thing was we made that, uh, we shot that scene down in North Carolina, down at uh, Southport, right by the coast. And I believe it was in like, it was March or April, it might even be, been later or earlier in the year, but it was so cold out and they had dialogue, right? So, and they were supposed to be having a beach party. So they had these big cranes and they would, they would say, okay, uh, 30 seconds. And they'd have all these people come out. And there'd be all these people shivering with their coats on and they'd throw their coats off and they'd have bikinis and, you know, and all these buff guys, you know, and stuff. <laughs> and they'd hit the music. Right. And so we'd get about, you know, about 10 seconds of the beat. And of course, we were this we were like that far away from our instruments because we couldn't make any noise. Nobody could. Right. Because they were doing dialogue. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden the music would come on. You grab the beat. The dancers would start dancing like this, you know twisting in the sand, and then dead silence. And everybody's going, you know, <laughs> we're going. It was, it was surreal. It was surreal, you know, but it was, it was being fun. Yeah. And a lot of those people in that movie went on to be pretty big stars, I think, you know? Absolutely. And, and I should say, at the moment, in, in that time and place, I like the movie. It's more of an aging thing. Strangest Ways, I should say, it's aged much better than that movie. You know, but <laughs> yeah. I think everybody Thank in the you. movie is doing Thank fine. Thank you. That's yeah. very kind of you. <laughs> There's a there's a lot of those fun moments. Um, again, I, I want to bring up on this uh, at home with record too. With uh, like, I had I did a double take when uh, when polka dot dress came on because I went that's that's eight p box eight piece box right? Well, yeah, the intro is really close. Yeah. And it's an a. I shouldn't be saying that, but it is. But you know that line in there about the polka dot gravy. I got that right from Hassel Atkins. Hassel you know, Atkins. Right? Right? Hassel I'm Atkins. Well, check him out. Check him out. I took him out to eat one. He was like a guy, a one man band from uh, West Virginia. And he was down here and I took him out to eat to get some pork chops and they wouldn't cook them the way he wanted them. So he asked for polka dot gravy. Right. <laughs> and the waitress just looks at him like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, and he, he was like, anyway, it was hilarious. He was well, very idea cool that, guy. Yeah, the idea of the callback anyway within a song, like I'm always a fan of that, especially, you know, in bands that have been around long enough. I mean, does that does that ever go through? Do you, do you all take those opportunities uh, often? Oh, well, sure, sure. Again, I think it comes back to the kind of the music historian that's in us all, right? And how, like, you can just kind of channel some of the feeling that you had about maybe that artist or that lyric or just knowing the guy because it's just a personal offhanded thing right eating dinner mm -hmm. someplace and uh and we're and you know he just talked about polka dot gravy you know and that and and that's you know i don't know it just pops in there and you go well that rhymes it'll work but it gives <laughs> you the right mental image you know <laughs> <laughs> but again, you're you're rhyming and everything. Like when I think, I want to go back to another song we were talking about earlier with "Don't Spill the Java." Like when I hear that song, I think how much of that was just improv on there. But but you like like Sparks, the band Sparks. You're so good a, in the way that they take those little moments and make them these grand, more epic type of things. You know, within three minute pop structure. Sure. No. I well, like I say, really, to find to be able to find inspiration in your daily routine or the things you do every day. Not only that, but, you know, lots of people do have routines. Everybody does. Right. And everybody that's something you can share with people also. Right. Something as simple as making a cup of coffee and how you get out the door with it without spilling it on yourself. Right. How you go to take that first sip way too soon and you burn your mouth. Right. And, and you know, it's just just stuff like that but people relate to it you know and it makes people smile yeah and to get it in there so i gotta ask then how does dear mr fantasy fit into all of this <laughs> strangely yeah well i always you know i always really liked the uh, the song and again it going back to like a like i don't think you should ever think about cover songs as a certain type of genre or you can do it or you can't do it, right? If you like the song, you like the melody, you like the, uh, you know, the, the structure, whatever, try it, give it a shot. And I always thought like, wow, Dear Mr. 
fantasy would sound so cool with a banjo, right? Because I always think of like, wow, what if what if like a, there was some hillbilly traffic fans out there? You know what I mean? And and how would they have done this in their garage, like back in you know nineteen you know seventy one or something? You know, up in Boone or you know, and just having some fun with it that way. You know, and that's mm-hmm. how it kind of started. And then. Mary did a, a great vocal on it, and I don't know, and we psychedelicized it up a little bit, you know what I mean? I, we're big fans of, like, Spaceman 3, and, and I mean, Pan and stuff like that. We're fooling around with some of the modulation and some of the Moog synthesizer on um, uh, on Don't Spill the Java. Those flatulent sounds are incredible, right? You know, we just have fun with it. Uh, we really like the, uh, the the Moog, I should say. Yeah. The Moog is really fun to play. And that's showing up on more and more of our, our recordings. Yeah, so, and it does. Yeah. It gives that, that cool sound that... Uh, well, it adds you know, a little something, you know? Yeah. That little something. <laughs> I'll, I'll quickly turn the uh, clocks back just for a season, too, because um, this is a year, what, too much uh, pork uh, for just one fork. It turns 30 this year. This is the 30th anniversary of that one. Yeah, um, that's 91. Right. I was... Um, I, it's just coincidental. I, I've been thinking about that time in music and that time in pop culture and how the allowance to be weird was starting to come up from, you know, the underground into the mainstream. You know, we saw it, we heard it in the music, we saw it on TV, you know, you get Ren and Stimpy and stuff like that a little bit after that or what whatnot. Did you, was that something that you were kind of seeing when you all were coming up? Like, when did you notice this was working, connecting with people outside of your own little space? Well, we, it was funny because we were never really part of the Chapel Hill scene or sound, which was much more kind of a REM mm-hmm. uh, vibe, indie vibe, and, and, and then Super Chunk and things like that. We always kind of existed on the periphery. So we were kind of free to just like fool around with stuff. But yet we had that kind of indie rock, uh, you know, kind of periphery that kind of influenced, I think, maybe the way we looked at some of the more traditional forms of music that we were playing with. And um, but I've just always loved blues and rockabilly and country music and to find a way to blend all those together, but make it like different. Right. It's like it's one thing to be a a uh, revival band but it's a different thing to be a revisionist Mm -hmm. band and i always thought that that's kind of what we were and i remember trying to find a way to make us stand out i remember like just talking to mary's mom mary's mom used to be in in theater right like local theater in roanoke virginia right and she had all these wigs and all these theatrical things and i said oh mary get some of your mom's wigs let's just wear them let's just have some fun and like I used to wear those old bib out overalls, but you know my grandpa was a uh, was a was a dairy farmer, and that's what he wore to work every day. And I thought, well, you know, if he wore his bibs to work every day, damn, I'm gonna wear my bibs to work every day. And you know what I mean? It just kind of evolved, and you know, so it's kind of like who we are and what we, you know, it's a little bit dress up, play, and a little bit of who we are, and we just mixed it all together. And we really do try to be entertaining. Yeah. Did you know, I mean, could you tell that you all sounded like, like nothing else at the time, though? Like, well, I, you know, yeah, and it wasn't anything that we really planned, you know, it was just that that's how we could play. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, we did the best we could, right? (laughs) You know, well, you know, it's pretty good. Yeah, well, when Dave, I remember when Dave came and joined. Because he and Mary had been in, uh, lived in Roanoke together, and they'd played in high school bands and doing frat shows in Blacksburg, Virginia Tech and stuff. And uh, Dave came down to join the band, and he had a huge drum kit, you know, just, you know, big rock kind of drum kit. And I, we were like, ah, nah, you got to get rid of that, Dave. And we, we were so mean to him. We were so mean to him. We made him, we made him get a, throw it all away, put it all away in a big box. And then we gave him a, he got a, uh, like a, a drain pan for changing your oil and he put it on a snare sand stand and he drilled a hole in it and put a little splash symbol. And then, uh, we gave him a, a beer box to put it all in that he could also use as a kick drum. And that was it. <laughs> and I played in a, I play, I had a little, uh, silver tone amp in the case. And Mary actually did have a bass with a little, you know, some sort of small, smaller PV thing. But, you know, we were driving around in a pickup truck all over the southeast, 
playing gigs and we didn't have any road cases. We couldn't afford them. So we just, there, everything had to be small enough to fit into a couple garbage bags, right? <laughs> we just tie it up. Mother of invention, right? That's the right, whole line exactly. right that's there. Some of our, and that's the story of our sound, I guess. Oh. <laughs> It'll fit in a garbage bag. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good title for something right there. If it'll fit yeah, in the garbage, but so. yeah. yeah, no, <laughs> I'm so glad it, it worked out the way it did. Um, I should point out right now, tentatively, well, I say tentatively, it's on the books. You guys are actually going to be here in Louisville on uh, October 14th, um, God willing, uh, at Headliners again. We'd love seeing you over there. What does the rest of the year look like for you? I mean, um, well, the bulk of our the bulk of our touring that I know that will will probably happen is in 2022, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, we have a pretty full full schedule in 2022, um, going out to the Midwest, out to Colorado, California, I think the Northeast in, at some point. So, but it's still also it's all just kind of tentative. We just keep rescheduling as needed, you know, and as things kind of open up or don't open up, mm -hmm. you know. None of us. Have, my wife's a nurse, so I get the lowdown. You know, and uh, she thinks that, uh, you know, by later in the fall next year, that things should be picking up, you yeah. know, she can't say much about the fall, though. So that that kind of, you know, we'll see. We'll just have we'll to see. see. We'll keep our fingers crossed. But, you know, we love Louisville. I've said this before, but we always used to go to Louisville whenever we had two days off and we were within like 200 miles. Right. Really? Because, yes, because you guys, Bargetown Road. Is uh -huh. the used to be, I don't know if it's still anymore, but they had the best used record stores, thrift stores. They had Guitar Emporium, right? And then I think at the very end of Bargetown Road, when you crossed over the, the beltway, the beltline, I think we used to we used to stay at a hotel down there called Airport Inn. Mm -hmm. It was like $29 a night, right? And it was across the street from that strip club, the Toy Tiger. Uh -huh. back, way back in the day yeah. anyway so whenever we had two days off and we didn't have any money that's where we headed man we <laughs> headed to louisville and we fill that van up we, yeah. we'd fill that van up with used records and stuff and so we couldn't even fit in it we'd have to go to the ups send it all back to north carolina <laughs> the tiger's gone they're now two thornton gas stations in its place yeah, that's what I heard. uh most of the record <laughs> stores are still here uh unfortunately uh, except for ear ecstasy but oh, John right. Timmons, who ran, who owned your ecstasy, is now a DJ for us at WFBK. So he's oh. still in the music community. But uh, oh, good. that's funny. That's fun <laughs> to hear. Anyway, um, I'm glad you all were able to use this time wisely. I mean, to get basically two albums out of this, uh, including the uh, the Kudzu uh, Records Presents. Uh, it's so fun what you all do. And thank you so much for continuing to do it. Oh, well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, really Rick, do. it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Uh, thanks for taking the time, man. Uh, hopefully we'll see you sooner than later. Yes, sir. You take care. All right. See you around, man. Bye. Bye-bye.